is also my first time back doing anything since the start of the pandemic, so it's a good way to start. All right, so I'm going to uh, begin by reading from today's lectionary reading, which is uh, Matthew 10, chapter 34 through 39. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake will find it. It's the word of the Lord. So I want to begin by talking about a, uh, a village I learned about in seminary. It's a small little village in France, out in the mountains, called La Chambon. I don't know if you've heard about it or not. There's been several documentaries. But it's one of my favorite stories of uh, the kind of the personification of the practice of this passage. Um, tiny little unassuming village, and it's an example of Christian resistance, nonviolent Christian resistance in the face of oppression. Um, so the minister of that town, this is back in the 1930s and 40s in France, which you might uh, recognize there's kind of a significance to that period of time in France. Um, his name was uh, Reverend Andre, Andre Trochme, and it was during World War II under Nazi occupation. And Reverend Trochme met with the leadership of the town and decided that uh, a plan of action needed to be done within their community to aid in the assistance of people who were being uh, injured during the Holocaust, uh, whether that be Jews or gypsies or gay people or just anyone who the Nazis needed or felt the need to, uh, to kill. So under Reverend Trachme's brave leadership, the community took it upon themselves to harbor and shelter the Jewish people who were fleeing the Holocaust. They hid people in their homes. There was a married couple in the village who uh, had a fake ID system uh, running out of their home. And the documentaries are, are wonderful because they're always the ones that are chosen to, to do a lot of the, the narration. And they're these wonderful kind of elderly couple now. And, and they're just talking about how they're making these fake IDs in the small town of France. It's great. Um, Jewish children who were in hiding be, uh, became students at the local school. Uh, the Jewish people uh, who were, were not just welcome there, they were welcome to also become one with the community. The community incorporated them seamlessly into the goings on of the town right under the Nazis' noses in this tiny little unassuming village. When the Nazi occupiers would patrol the village, the uh, Jewish people were placed under floorboards or other hiding spots, or their fake IDs served. From the Nazi perspective, this was just an unassuming little French town with almost no importance. And the reality is that we now know the citizens of La Chambon were able to rescue somewhere between 3,000 or 5,000 Jewish lives during Nazi occupation. And I love Lo Shambon's story. I love it because to me it represents what the kingdom of God coming to earth looks like. In the face of horrific oppression, Christians came together as an alternative community to the patterns of the world around it and brought healing, safety, and rescue to a suffering people who were crying out for help under the boot of the empire. It's an example of what non-violent Christian conflict looks like. And passages like the one I just read, Matthew 10, 34 to 39, and the ones that are, that are like that, that are more spiritually combative, uh, they've been hard for me to talk about. I think those of us who are more progressively minded Christians or people who uh, are, are, are 
just used to preaching in churches, you know, they don't, they kind of tend to want to avoid verses like these because they're so, they almost seem counter Christ in a way. We've gotten used to having these passages deployed very often as excuses for violence against others. But we need only to look to Saint, to Saint Reverend, as I like to call him, Saint Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who in his letter from Birmingham jail cried out against the passivity of what he called the white moderate. And I didn't start to understand the appeal of preaching on combative passages like this, or maybe even like a fire and brimstone sermon or two, uh, until I came out as a gay Christian. Uh, seriously, because I have so many friends now, so many stories from my LGBT friends where they've had to face some of the worst abuse I've ever heard, quite often from their own families. I figured out why a person would want to preach hellfire on other people. And according to a survey conducted by the Williams Institute, 40%, 40%, almost half of all homeless youth are homeless because they're LGBT and they were kicked out of their families because of the, their families were religious. 40%, almost half. So I understand the anger. I get the, uh, the energy behind some of those fire and brimstone preachers now. And absolutely did I feel the wrath and the anger when I watched the video of George Floyd's last moments as he cried out for his mother beneath an oppressor's knee. And as he cried out for his mother, and as, as, as I see the callousness of law enforcement as they respond to the collective grief of the black community, firing rubber bullets into people's faces, or shooting people in the face with tear gas canisters at point blank range, or pushing the elderly onto, sidewalk, onto the sidewalk, placing them in critical condition. Or when members of an Episcopal church are tear gassed off of their own church's property as they were handing out water to protesters. So I understand combative spirituality. Now that I've seen a black man lynched just for running through a white neighborhood, or a black woman shot to death in her own home by white police officers while she was asleep, or a black man shot in the back at a Wendy's, or black people being found hanging from trees around the United States within the last few days, and I recognize that in my white privilege, my anger is nothing compared to the anger and sorrow of the black community as they have to watch yet another life get snuffed out by a of power structures. So I can understand hellfire sermons now, at least a little bit. I'm not a hellfire kind of guy. Uh, and if you've, uh, if you're at the pub theology last year, um, that was led by my mentor, Dr. Chip Kui, you know why I'm not a hellfire kind of guy. Uh, it's a long story. We'll get to it at some other point, but, um, but I get the desire for divine retribution. These have been weeks where I've been angry, and, and I've been uh, I've, I've been resonating a lot with a lot of these combative sermons, because marginalized communities such as people of color and LGBT folks, we encounter the kind of wickedness that can inspire the types of sermons that talk about quote the wrath of an angry God, while still recognizing how detrimental to spiritual well-being and spiritual health that those sermons can be. Because we don't serve a tyrant god. We don't worship Moloch, who was an ancient pagan god of war. And we don't worship Zeus. Uh, Ziza, no, wow. <laughs> we don't worship Zeus, uh, who's firing lightning bolts from the top of Mount Olympus. I just combined Zeus with Jesus there. That was great. Um, no, we worship. A lot of people, yeah, I mean, there's, I guess we can kind of call it like this juice. <laughs> uh, but we don't worship Zeus. We don't worship Moloch. We worship Jesus, who is Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. He's not on the top of Mount Olympus. He's not throwing lightning bolts down us. If anything, Jesus is standing right next to us, receiving the lightning bolts with us. If there's some angry, evil entity firing at us, Jesus, if anything, standing right next to us. God is with us. When I, uh, when I told my boyfriend uh, two weeks ago that I was going to be preaching on uh, no peace but a sword, he looked at me and then he kind of like stared off into the distance a little bit and he went, 
You know, I honestly don't think I've ever heard anyone preach on that before. Which is really saying something because he's a missionary kid. He was, he was raised in a missionary household. So to hear him say that he hasn't heard a sermon over something is, uh, is impressive. Because I've, I just assumed he'd heard everything. Like the entire Bible had been preached to him. But uh, I don't think we want to preach on these verses because they seem just so counterintuitive to what we're doing in the Christian faith. Because how can Jesus be the Prince of Peace and yet claim to not bring peace but a sword? How can Christ, who instructed us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, who said that we're to turn the other cheek and that blessed are the peacemakers and blessed are the meek, how can that Christ tell us that he did not come to bring peace but that instead he brings a sword? And that we're to hate our own families? It's a bizarre teaching, and it was one of the most difficult things for me to, to wrap my head around uh, for a long time. And of course, I, I'm still challenged by these teachings because that's how good teaching works. It keeps challenging you. So what's going on here? Why does Christ teach that his coming brings a sword and not peace? And I think the problem lies in this passage, and when we translate it into modern culture, is that we don't understand what peace means anymore. We've lost touch with the meaning of peace and the meaning of conflict, for that matter. We think we know what it means. We think we understand peace. But I don't think we do. Because we've been taught to think that peace is a lack of conflict. We tend to think of like almost a sanitization, a sanitizing existence, which is saying something because we do sanitize everything right now for a pandemic, which is good. Uh, peace is often represented as this neutral blank space. Peace is passive. It's not moving, inert. It uh, sort of sounds like peace is death a little bit. Um, and I think that version of peace is not too far away from death. Maybe it's a good way to describe it. It's death. And I'm going to be very, very clear. Peace is not a lack of conflict. It is not a lack of conflict between people. As one of my favorite authors, Sarah Shulman, wrote, um, conflict is not abuse. It's the name of her most recent book. This is because not all conflict is inherently violent in nature. Not all conflict is somebody forcing their will onto another human being. Not all conflict inflicts harm. Anybody who's ever been in a committed relationship knows that conflict is an inevitability. And it's not always a bad thing. We argue sometimes. We have to. We have to argue sometimes. Uh, that's how growth happens. Because often conflict leads to healing. Healthy conflict leads to healing. I took a, a fun class in seminary about uh, a couple of years ago called uh, Conflict Management. And, uh, and, and you'll notice that the title of that class is Conflict Management. It's not Conflict Avoidance or Conflict, I don't know, Doing Away With. It's, it's Conflict Management. In other words, walking through conflict, the inevitability of conflict, this thing that's always, that's always going to be there in a way that's healthy. Guiding a conflict, right? Not destroying a conflict, not getting rid of it. And in this class, we uh, talk about this really fun theory uh, called the, conf uh, the chaos theory of, of conflict management, which uh, sounds really heady, uh, kind of up in the clouds, but it's, but it's, it's nice, it's cool. It's this idea uh, that essentially when, it, when an organization of people, like a church, or no, yeah, maybe even a country, realizes that the old way of doing things is so unhealthy that sometimes the best thing to do is get ourselves intentionally lost. We intentionally lead ourselves into the unknown, into an unknown forest where the trees are so close together that we can't see our way forward. We get ourselves lost on purpose. We do this so that we can then make room in our minds for something completely different, something new. Sometimes what we think we know can get in the way of learning something different. What can happen 
what can happen if we forget our old paradigm and work on doing something else? And the scary thing about this way of doing things is that it forces the organization and the people within it to deconstruct many of their preconceived notions of the way things are in order to be able to consider new possibilities. And that really stinks because if you're anything like me, you hate change. Um, seriously, I, I claim to be this, uh, this progressive preacher, this, this progressive dude, um, but I really, really hate change. I love my routines because um, they make me feel comfy and cozy. But the uncomfortable reality is that without being able to ditch old concepts or remake them into something better, we will never grow as human beings, ever. We cannot mature if we cannot let go of what we think we know. So the, this chaos theory of conflict management is not really chaos. It's just order trying to figure itself out again. It's order that's allowed itself to kind of wander off into the woods and discover something new about itself. And it'll come back to order again. This is why conflict is so important. This is why Jesus is claiming to have not brought peace but a sword. This is why Christ beckons his followers to be willing to conflict with their families. When we read the uh, letters of Paul to some of the churches he founded, uh, we encounter a people that have had to break ties with a lot of the systems that they'd gotten used to. The Thessalonians, for example, I, I did a paper, my, my final paper for my master's uh, degree was over the Thessalonians, was over the topic. The, the Thessalonians were a small little church for me that got founded by Paul, and they, many of their, of their members had been kicked out of their families when they joined the Christian movement, because Christianity, the kingdom of God, was conflicting so much, it was conflict, it was conflicting so much with the empire, with the Roman Empire, and the, and the what was called the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. This idea that Rome was going to supply all of everyone's needs. Um, and so the Thessalonians were a church of unwanted children. A church of people who were getting booted out for representing a different way. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a, uh, a theologian from, well, again, World War II, um, in his Cost of Discipleship, he discusses something that's called a cheap grace. And cheap grace is the idea that we can somehow achieve peace or have peace uh, without a commitment to a positive change of any kind. In other words, it's a false peace. It's that blank, inert space I talked about earlier, that death. It's a willingness to return to the status quo instead of actually solving the problem. And that's not peace. That can't be peace. Because it's not justice. That's not actively working to take part in the kingdom project of God to set the world to rights. That's just allowing injustice to stand so that we don't have to put in any real work. Cheap grace is allowing injustice to flourish because we are afraid of nonviolent, nonviolent, that's the key, healthy conflict. Another phrase that we have in the Christian tradition that I'm very fond of is this idea of restorative justice. Restorative justice is the idea that we cannot truly have peace until the church actively works to promote a healthy reconstruction of the world that surrounds us. It is not enough to simply not fight. It is not enough to simply be nonviolent. Now, I refer to myself as a Christian pacifist. I still do. I strongly believe that Christ has called us to never inflict harm on our neighbors, even and especially to our enemies. We are to love our enemies. And you cannot inflict harm on someone who you're, who you're trying to love. That's where my theology has landed. But I don't call myself a Christian pacifist because I'm passive. We are not called to be passive. We are called to be active because we serve an active creator. And yes, there are times when we must strive for stillness, strive for the quiet solitude where it's just ourselves and God searching our souls. But there are also moments when we have to stand up and face the conflict between the kingdom of the empire and the kingdom of God head on. 
Caesar, Pharaoh, or a president, these people are never going to love the vulnerable because they're powerful and power must proliferate itself. It has to continue itself and power when it continues itself, when it proliferates itself, it does so at the expense of the vulnerable. So we must co-suffer, as Israel said last week, with the vulnerable. I do not believe that Christian pacifism is passive. We are people of transformation and resurrection and redemption. We must strive for positive change. We must be willing to show the world the beauty of the mystery of the dark forest of uncertainty. We must invite humanity, the world around us, to wander into the trees at night, not knowing exactly where we're going, but striving to see what paradigms we can transform that were initially just leading us to death. I'm reminded of the power of a, a liturgical season that's coming up in a few months called the season of Advent, where that's the whole thing. You're, you're anticipating a new way of doing things. The whole world is invited into an unknowing, into a dark forest. The nights even get shorter, or get longer. The nights even get longer. It's a dark time, and I love it. It's one of my favorite times of the year because of that mystery. What's going to happen? The Christ child's coming. What's going to happen? It's going to make all things new. But in order for a mystery to matter, it has to be a breakdown of our understanding of the world. Jesus didn't come to make things continue the way that they were. Jesus came to, in the words of the poet Cesar Chavez, comfort the disturbed and disturb the comfortable. Jesus arrived to change the world, and he didn't stop when he ascended because he left us. We're still here. There is still blessed mystery to be lived out. We have to think beyond our paradigms of death and decay and think in terms of breathing new life into the world around us, allowing the Spirit of God to give us voices inside of dead systems. That's why it's so important that the church celebrates things like Pride Month. That's why it's so important that the church marches with our brothers and sisters of color. Because the marginalized have been hurt by systems of death for so long, for too long. And people of color have been stripped of their dignity for too long by a justice system that does not truly know itself. And the justice system needs a spiritual understanding, a spiritual undertaking, so that it can know itself. It does not know justice. We cannot have peace without truly knowing and practicing justice. There cannot be peace without justice. These two things can't exist outside of one another. So the church has to invite the world to sojourn, to journey, to wander. We must be willing to change. We must be willing to do away with a false peace, this cheap grace and actually move into the divine mystery of the God we serve. The new way of living, what I like to call the kingdom ethic. That's why Jesus said that he did not come to bring peace but a sword. Because this new way of doing life, this new way of loving our enemies and praying for those who persecute us, this new way of challenging the empire by promoting the peace of the kingdom of God, this new way is a direct challenge to any way of living that devalues the humanity of another person. Death is the way of empire. Death is the way of power. That is the way of the American empire, just as it was with first century Rome 2,000 years ago. That's the deadly way of any governing force, any governing force that prioritizes its own self-perpetuation over the lives of its vulnerable citizens. So we as Christians nonviolently conflict with that way of doing life. Because that is not life. The way of empire is not life. The Pax Romana, Peace of Rome, or maybe Pax Americana, that's not, that's not a way of doing life. It's a way of self-perpetuating power. The self-sacrificing way of Jesus, that is true life. So marching with people of color who are facing persecution every day at the hand of corrupt systems, or walking side by side with those of us in the LGBT community who've been kicked out of our families and our churches for the way God made us, that is the conflict that Christ is talking about. Our swords are our communities who work together to cut through the deadly insanity of oppression. 
I know that we often use the sword as a, as a biblical example. Of, of the, as a, we, we talk about the sword as the Bible very often, and that's fine. But I also like to imagine that it's, it's the church, it's the community as well, as a way of cutting through empire, nonviolently. Lo Shumbon came together as a sword like that. They cut through the evil of the Nazi occupation of France by becoming an alternative way of life, an alternative to empire, an alternative to death-oriented policies. So I guess I'm inviting the church to be like La Chambon, be like that tiny little French village in World War II that hid and sheltered Jewish people and made them one of their community. Christ did not bring peace, not when we're talking about church and empire. Christ brings a sword of justice for the oppressed. The peace of the Lord is accompanied by justice, by actual healing, by the resurrection of a world battered by the injustices of racism and homophobia. So I say with confidence, in the name of Jesus, the Son of God, happy Pride Month and Black Lives Matter. May the justice-led peace of the Lord be always with this church and with the world. Amen. We're going to start taking, partaking of our communion now. Um, this is where we, we think back to that night where uh, Jesus and his disciples were eating for the last time, the Last Supper. And things are about to change forever. They'd already started to change forever. But this new way of living, this new kingdom, this new world, inaugurated by Jesus, uh, was stirring in the company of these believers. And so he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, take, eat, all of you. This is my body broken for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Take it in remembrance of me. Go ahead. And as he took the cup, he said, drink this, all of you. This is the blood shed for you for forgiveness of your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. 